Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 56. All writing is a discipline, but screenwriting is a drill sergeant. Robert McKee. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. The show is also sponsored by my new book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, How to Turn Your Independent Film into a Money-Making Business. In it, I discuss how to actually create the film entrepreneur model and how to make money with your film or films and do it again and again so you can actually build a successful career and business. So if you want to pre-order the book, head over to filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. Guys, today on the show, we have Jeffrey Calhoun, who is the author of the number one best-selling screenwriting book, the Guide for Every Screenwriter, From Synopsis to Subplots, The Secrets of Screenwriting Revealed. Now, it's a bold statement, this book, but apparently somebody likes it because it's number one in screenwriting books on Amazon. Now, Jeffrey is a multi-award winning screenwriter and is very sought after for his script consultation and script doctoring. And he's also the director of the Script Summit Screenplay Contest and is listed one of the biggest screenplay competitions in the world. Now, I wanted to get Jeffrey on the show to talk shop and really dig into his book, The Guide for Every Screenwriter, because, you know, it's a pretty bold statement. So I wanted to hear his point of view, how he's doing it, what makes his method different than all the other methods out there. And he definitely came to play and brought the goods in this episode without question. And at the end of the episode, I'm also going to give you links to a screenwriting mentorship, a story concept development service, a script doctor clean and polish service, and assistance with log lines, synopsis, and treatments, all services put on by Jeffrey's company. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Enjoy my conversation with Jeffrey Calhoun. I'd like to welcome to the show Jeffrey Calhoun, brother. How you doing, man? Good, man. Thanks a lot for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, man. Thanks for thanks for being on. We're going to hopefully drop some knowledge bombs on the screenwriting tribe today. Uh, but before we get going, man, what? Uh, how did you get into the business, man? I actually started on a bet about 15 <laughs> years ago. It's the, best, it's the best beginning to any story about the film. Okay, you got the business yeah, ever. Yeah, I had, I had no bet. aspirations to be a writer at all. <laughs> all right, so how did you do it? I had a friend that I was working with, and he was an editor on a, uh, on a local TV show. It was like a morning show, and he wanted to get into screenwriting. So he wanted to motivate himself to write it. So he uh, bet me out of the blue to write a screenplay. It was more like a scriptment, and um, we had like a month to do it. So, you know, I got like, you know, a bunch of books, screenplay, and stuff like that. And I wrote it. And, uh, and then we compared and, and I, I ended up winning, but, uh, you know, I was really into it cause I'm, I'm a little competitive and I don't, you know, people don't realize that. Uh, so then I set it down on the kitchen table and, uh, my wife read it. She's like, Hey, you know, this is pretty good. And, and I said, I, I actually confessed to her, like, I really got a kick out of it. I really like this thing. And, uh, which is funny cause I'm dyslexic and writing for me is, was, was very difficult, um, so I ended up trying it again and I just fell in love with it and haven't stopped since. That's amazing. Now, you know, we were talking a little bit about this on, on off air, but there are so many different people. There's a, there's a few screenwriting books out there. There's a couple, 
There's a couple. Yeah. There's a at least uh, there's Sid Field and like Save the Cat, and I think there's a couple of those. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe one or two other screenwriting books out there. Um, what makes your book, which is called The Guide for Every Screenwriter, which mm-hmm. is a which is a bold sir, a bold title in the screenwriting <laughs> space? I have to say, one of the reasons I caught my eye, I was like, well, who's this guy? Um, yeah. What makes your perspective on screenwriting different than uh, than the plethora of other options out there? No, that's a great question. I mean, the the title is supposed to wave a flag, of course, but um, I wanted this to be the biggest little book in screenwriting. I wanted this to be a one-stop shop in screenwriting because something I found with the industry of, of screenwriting books is that they all kind of specialize in one particular mm-hmm. field. And so you end up having a library of like 20 books. And I wanted to take all of that, condense it into one book while still really honoring these great screenwriting masters because uh, I don't believe in reinventing the wheel. You know, mm-hmm. and and then write this in a way that is so efficient and fun to read that you can be, you know, going back to it regularly. It could be your desktop book. It could be your back pocket book and um, and really get a lot out of this thing. That's awesome. Man. Yeah, because it's it, you're right. There's a there's well, there's a thousands of books and they all are like because screenwriting is such a vast deep, dark hole that you could fall into. Yeah. I mean, you could literally just talk about character arcs for 200 pages. You yeah. know, it's, it's, and there's actually a book called Character Arcs, which is a 200 page book. <laughs> you know? Okay, well, there you go. You know, there's, so there's multiple ways you do it. So to kind of put together a guide that kind of at least hits everything you need, and you could always go deeper into any specific yep. field and any specific thing, but just something kind of like that reference guide. Yeah, uh, is a great idea. Now, what advice would you give for filmmakers? You know, because I think genre is a big issue. Uh, mm. People people get pigeonholed in. Uh, oh, I'm only the comedy writer. I'm only the action yeah. writer. I'm only the romance, and romantic comedy guy or girl. What advice would you give to write in any genre? Because I know a lot of screenwriters out there would love to just jump, like the Coen Brothers do. Yeah. <laughs> like to jump from wherever they want to go and just do it. Any tips? Yeah, man. I, don't limit yourself to genre. Um, I, I have this section of the book called The Myth of Writing What You Know, where people um, think that they should only just stay in that little circle. And that really pigeonholes you as a writer and limits your, your overall vision. Uh, I tell in the book, you know, if you're a horror writer, write a rom-com and just see the difference. Do your research on a rom-com and see the tone, hit the beats. And I even give like methods of how to do that type of research in the book. Um, but really doing that will give you a larger overall breadth of, of writing and make you even better and deepen your craft. I mean, me, myself, I can't be married to a particular genre because I work as a, as a script doctor or a consultant where I get called in to fix screenplays. I mean, sometimes last minute, like days before shooting, I come in and I do a rewrite, you know, <laughs> and I can't be limited to a, a horror and just say, well, you know, it's a rom-com, you guys are SOL. Like, I have to be able to come in, right? And right. really kind of hit those hit those beats and those tones. So I think, yeah, if you want to be a better writer, work outside of your genre. You know, just be brave and do it. And when you're building a screenplay, it's, it is very similar to building a house. You know, the, the bones of all stories are similar, if not the same. Different, there's different blueprints, let's say, for different kinds of houses. But there's a limited amount of houses you can buy. But generally speaking, the, the bones are the same. The structure, the frame yeah. is all the same. The foundation's the same. It's when mm-hmm. you start designing within those parameters, it's what makes a story, what makes a screenplay work. Every mm-hmm. once in a while, you'll get a Pulp Fiction that kind of is like, well, no, we're just going to build a whole other kind of thing over here. <laughs> or there's those kind of films yeah. that just kind of like – throw everything upside down. But that's very rare, generally speaking. And even then, even when you, and I, I've talked about Pulp Fiction multiple times on the show, even if you look at it's Pulp great. Fiction, if, even if you look at Pulp Fiction and you say, oh, it's so like, it's all over the place. Like if you look at it and you yeah. actually find the beats, he's hitting the yeah. exact beats. But, and that's what makes that film so <clears throat> ridiculously genius. Like how do you do that with changing the timeline, with jumping back yeah. and forth, and you're still hitting the beats. Like, that's insanity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And no, I mean, Tarantino is a master of structure and he really loves to play with it. And I always respect that when a writer can just play with structure and come with something out of left field. Um, it gives you um, a good template of like, okay, I can do that now. And then you really start to try and figure out and break that down. So yeah, I agree. The structure is there. And, and when you start to master that thing, you really start to see the craft change. Another guy, another writer who's like that would be, um, 
of Jonathan Nolan. You know, if you look at at Westworld, the TV show, I mean, oh, my God, they're knocking them out of the park. The structure is is amazing, but it's all there. The beats are there, especially with that, you know, full season arc. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole other like a whole other conversation to talk about series work versus (laughs) screenwriting. It's just like feature work. But at the end of the day, though, it's similar beats. It's similar things. It's just stretched out over a larger budget uh, or or a larger time frame without question. Um, Now, can you the one thing a lot of screenwriters always, especially young screenwriters coming out, is what's a high concept versus a low concept? Sure. That's that's a big thing. Can you just explain to people what a high and low concept is? Oh man, thank you. I appreciate that. I actually love talking about this um, because high concept is so huge right now. But I actually have some theories on it. So high concept is really an easily explainable idea. It's something that's easy to market, which is kind of why uh, producers really hop on it because uh, it's it, it tends to have a wider demographic. So you know something like Jurassic Park is a is a high concept uh, film because it's you know. Uh, a dinosaur park where the dinosaurs get out and go crazy. It's really easy to explain, but a low concept or also called like a non high concept is really your character study uh, film. It's the, it's the um, indie film where they kind of lean into a character and less about the world and more about how the character sees the world and interacts with the world. And personally, I, I feel that uh, high concepts are, are getting less popular and you're seeing lower returns um, on these films, but you're seeing an uptake in, in the low concept character study films. And a ni- nice example I like to use is that new Joker film coming out with Joaquin mm-hmm. Phoenix. I mean, that's a low concept film mm-hmm. and it's getting, it's getting a lot of buzz. And I think you're going to really start seeing that a big uptake in that with the, with the market right now. Yeah. I think, I think the audience, well, the thing is that the audience is just getting smarter, man. We're so much yeah. more sophisticated. I mean, you know, you and I are of, of, of similar vintages. So, you know, we, um, we, we've seen hundreds of thousands of hours of entertainment and story. And mo- I, I must have easily seen tens of thousands of movies in my life. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, with, without, I mean, I worked in a video store. So, I mean, for four years, five years, something like that. So, I mean, I've seen a lot yeah. of stuff in my day. So all of that input and, and we're trained, like we're in the business. Yeah. So yeah. can you imagine someone who's not in the business and still, like I always use my wife as the the barometer. Like if she calls it out, like she's like, oh, that's the, the character development was just so weak, wasn't it? And I'm like, who are you? And, and yeah. I didn't marry yeah. this. Like I don't understand how you, how you know that. She's like, look, I've been living with you for so many years. Something has to have rubbed off at some, some point or another. But when she's talking, I'm like, oh, the car- oh the, there was just no motivation there or – Oh, this yeah. just, it felt dry or this or that. It's interesting to see people outside the business. And that's what the, the reality is of our world now. We're so savvy. And can you imagine the kids coming up now? Oh, well, I mean, my, my son is, uh, you know, he started writing screenplays and he actually won a bunch of awards. He's 13 now. But when he was 10, before Bastard. he was First really all, getting so, getting so, into screenwriting. So let's stop huh? this. Let's stop this right here. Bastard. I can't believe a 13 year old is writing screenplays. I didn't even know what a movie camera was at 13. Yeah. Are you kidding me? I know. I can't believe it either. <laughs> I, no, I, I had a kid on who's like, yeah, I'm 17. I've, I've shot, you know, like six features already. And I've, uh, you know, yeah. And I've have, they're on Amazon Prime. I'm making a little bit of money with them, but I really want to wow. take. And I'm like, first of all, we all hate you to understand that right away. <laughs> so let's get that out of the way and let's move on from there. But no, it's, it's just a different world. Like it's a world that you and I can't even think about because it was just you know we didn't didn't have it it didn't exist i didn't mean to call your son a bastard i apologize move on all right so you're saying so i won't won't tell him all right so Uh, he really started at 10 years old so that even makes it better we were we were sitting in a theater and this is before he started writing um and we got through a movie and i don't want to name it but he looked over to me and he goes that character development was terrible oh, you and the name. ending please of the movie it. totally okay. destroyed the arc and oh, i was like whoa hold on please, a second please name it please name it no. <laughs> i i don't want to name it's it. justice <laughs> league it's justice league go ahead, just say no, go ahead. <laughs> well he had issues with that one too i'm sure <laughs> um, but i looked at him and i was like do you want to do you want to do what daddy does and he's like well, i'll give it a shot so then he wrote his little screenplay and, that's and, awesome yeah yeah it was cool yeah. So, I mean, they're just, they get it, you know, they've seen the same beats, like you said, and they've kind of learned it through osmosis. 
Right, exactly. I mean, the things like, you know, when I read Sid Field's book, that was the first time, I think for a lot, for an entire generation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was like the book that everyone was like, what? what? We all the sa- it's all the yeah. same story? At, at 20 minutes, something happens? At this time, it happens here? Like, that was mind-blowing to me. And I wasn't even in – I think I was just – I wasn't even in film school. I just got out in film school when I read that. It was insane when I read that. And now that's common knowledge. Like, the hero's journey, everybody yeah. knows the hero's journey. Like, you know, it's just something that's built into our psyche at this point in the game. So I, that would make sense why high-concept movies are starting to waver. And yeah. the Joker is a really great example of that. I was going to ask you, where, where does the Matrix fall in? Because the Matrix is not high-concept. It is and it isn't. Because you yeah, can't it pitch that. that balance, doesn't it? Yeah, you can't pitch that in, in a sentence. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. Uh, they definitely lean into the the monomyth figure, though the, sure. the the holy figure that way. And so I think by doing that, they're able to to lean into the intercharacter relationships, and then they really explore that world. And exploring that world is definitely a high concept take. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I think they strike that balance, which is incredibly difficult. You know. That's why it's a it's a masterpiece. I mean, that first yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, it's classic. I mean, it, it, that's why I use it in the book. Yeah, I mean, it's there's there's certain movies that come out and they just kind of change things. And The Matrix was definitely one of those films when it came out. It definitely changed things without question. Now, can you um can you can you give me some ideas of how to create a high concept uh, project? Some tips. Um, well, I think one of my favorite tips is to find a classic and then put a nice twist on it. And that is that is a good way to to get into a high concept with with something that's original, but yet put your own spin on. Like I think of um, what was the one that's Chris Hemsworth and Snow White. It's like Snow White and the Huntsman. Oh yeah, yeah, the Huntsman you know? or, or the, yeah. the Monte Account of Monte Cristo or something along those lines. Yeah, yeah, I think that that doing that, and then just when you're coming up with your concept, you want to just keep bringing it down and making it simple and more simple and easy to understand because. When you get into concepts that are like two, three, four cents, as long as like, it's too much, you got to cut it down. Make so, it easier. Make it easier. So what's an, uh, when you're saying make it easier, you're just thinking is like simp- simplify the story. So like Jurassic simplify Park. Simplify the story. So Jurassic Park is so simple. It's like it's a dinosaur park where the dinosaurs are alive. I mean that that pretty yeah, much that's is – That's the sales pitch. Yeah. That's the sales that's pitch. Um, yeah. You know – but what is like the superhero genre is so monstrous right now, uh, and it's I mean it is it is the film industry. If you take out Marvel, it is. it's huge right if now. If you take Marvel away from the film industry over the last ten years, they would have. I mean seriously, twenty billion dollars would be gone, like simply. No, yeah, I, I, they're 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 definitely huge. They've 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 created their own market and kind of saved the industry in several ways, which is just crazy. It's in, it's in, it is insane. I mean, we could talk a little bit about Marvel. St- I mean, because I, I always, and I, I don't want to do the Marvel DC thing, but I see a Marvel character in your background, so I, I'm assuming you're a Marvel guy. I see an yeah, Iron Man. Okay. I, I, a little bit more. <laughs> okay, yeah, I see because you're Star Wars and Marvel. I'm, I'm assuming you're Marvel. Um, yeah. It, it, I, I like stories. I mean, I like DC movies as well. There, I mean, I love Batman and all that stuff. Though, arguably, Batman is the only Marvel character in the dc universe but that's a whole other conversation if you think okay. about it if you think no you think. no I, I, I yeah i can see it. <laughs> so yeah i can see it I, I love to ask i love to ask story um you know gurus or alchemists if you will why marvel has made it so been so successful oh and yeah dc has not and they and you know and i i well, be- that's good. I, I mean i beat up justice league so much because it is it is the lowest hanging fruit there was like you're yeah. talking about the five four or five biggest superheroes with the biggest you know no you know like no one knew the hell iron man is the avengers like <laughs> these know. were all bc he's characters a, he's a b character and, and and they nailed it. i mean but you gotta look at the casting though I mean, no but it's the he casting that character oh yeah. no it, it, there's you know thor you know like black widow like are you kidding me like hawkeye like do you all the work that had to be built to build up that entire movie where literally all you had to say is batman superman and wonder woman are going to be in this movie that's all you have to say, and everybody in the world knows what that is. And they screwed it up so royally that it's upsetting. <laughs> like well, it was literally upsetting. So, I, I, in your opinion, what do you think Marvel has done, and why their films have hit so many 
beats and so much success when yeah. the DCs have it as well, much. It's the long game for Marvel because the brilliant thing they've done is with each film they release, they release it in a different type of tone. So you'll have, you know, Captain America Civil War is more like a World War II film. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, is more like a spy thriller, whereas Captain America was more like, you know, World War II. Um, but then you have Thor Ragnarok that's obviously a comedy. So they, they keep releasing it and Psychod- they change it up. Psychedelic, what was that? A psychedelic comedy. Yeah. <laughs> the awesome. colors and it was just oh amazing. My, vibrant. Yeah. Oh. I mean, so, so they keep changing it up, you know. And the Marvel movies that don't do well are the Marvel movies where they don't have that really interesting new type of tone where it freshens it up. Um, whereas DC, they kind of kept trying to just uh, imitate, you know, the Dark Knight and go dark and dark and dark. Um, and the audience kind of got tired of it. And so by the time they brought, you know, Wonder Woman and Aquaman, and I think it was too late because they were changing up the tone there a bit. Um, and then they just leaped right into the Justice League. But the groundwork wasn't laid the way it needed to be. Um, so you get a you get a film that tonally is all over the place. It's dark and somber, but then it's funny and then it's a buddy comedy. But we don't really know the characters and their relationships aren't really that well defined. So I actually think about this a lot, and I feel that DC is better suited for uh, television. I think if they were given a bit longer of a game on television, um, I think they would be far more successful. And Marvel will continue to be rocking out these films in their phase. What are they in phase 20 now? Three. Um, <laughs> phase three. Three or four. Yeah, I, think phase, phase four. Yeah. I think it's phase and, four. And, and you're going to see more and more um, – various uh, 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 genres coming out. I think with that Black Widow, it's going to be another spy thriller. And um, and you'll see really cool stuff like that. I mean, they're bringing in Shang-Chi, right? So that's going to be like a Kung Fu action film. It's totally different. I mean, when's the last right. time you see that? I mean, so and, I, I and, also, and also Natalie Portman is going to be the new Thor eventually. Yeah. So that's yeah. going to be like insane. Yeah, like, cool. I mean, it's, there's so much cool, you know, and then blades coming back, but blade being done within the world of the Marvel, the MCU. Right. Um, right. And they're talking about bringing Deadpool in. So that could be really oh, interesting. We haven't even you talked know? about X-Men Deadpool Wolverine <laughs> with, you know, fighting along the side. Like they haven't even, we haven't even spoken about fantastic four and all these other yeah, oh, God, X-Men and maybe we'll finally get a real fantastic four movie. <laughs> Oh, man. That's going to be a hard one to figure out. That'd it's, be a tough. I would. I would like that challenge just because that's such a tough nut to crack. It's well, they've tried it a bunch of times and they have not been able to hit it. But look, man, they made Ant Man. I know. I mean, they made Ant Man. They made which Guardians, is a, which is a heist film, right? Which is a heist film. Yeah, heist film. Both of them. Well, the, the, and, and Wasp is kind of like a romantic yeah. heist film. Like a yeah, exactly. will they, won't they? Kind of when Harry met Sally. Uh, another, another different genre, right? So they just and, keep hitting these different genres throughout each film. And they made Guardians of the Galaxy. Are you – like we're not even on the B or C level characters. That was <laughs> basically the bottom of the bargain bin. Like yeah, nobody so. – everyone was like, what? Did you ever see the um, the Saturday Night Live skit about like Guardians of the Galaxy, about Marvel? Like Guardians <laughs> of the Galaxy is coming out. And you know what? We're Marvel. So f you, because we do, we could do whatever we want. We're gonna have a talking raccoon, and you you're not gonna love it. Why? Because we're Marvel. That's awesome. We're gonna have a talking tree. Why? Because we're Marvel. What are you gonna do? Watch DC. <laughs> it's just brilliant. It's a brilliant, brilliant skit. Uh, all right, so we've gone off this. I, I've gone on the tangent. I do those tangents every once in a while with the Marvel stuff. All right. But- but we'll get we'll, we'll we'll get back we'll get back to the screenwriting. But it's important because I want I want people to understand why those characters and why those movies have resonated in a way that no other series ever in the history of films have, has done. Yeah. They, and there's something to be studied there, uh, and to lay down that they laid down the work. They took the time. You know, if they imagine if they would have brought out the Avengers before Thor. Mm. Or before, um, what was it, Thor or Captain America, and they just kind of threw yeah. these characters. Like, it would have never it worked. It would have never worked. Well, it, it goes back to what we talked about earlier about trying out different genres. You know, obviously Marvel has proven, you know, doing these different genres can lead to success. So as a, as a screenwriter, why would you ever want to limit yourself to a genre? Yeah, and that's, and I've never actually, I've never thought about it before like that with the Marvel films being different genres, but they are. They're yeah. all... They're all – they all have the good ones like, you know, you watch uh, Winter Soldier. That's just an amazing spy thriller. Absolutely. It's kind of like when you watch Dark Knight 
well, that's just heat. That's just a great, yeah. that's just heat with a, it's with heat. a superhero. Yeah. It's it, heat it, with it, a superhero and a crazy yeah. man. It's amazing. It's really, really good. Um, now you also talk about mind mapping in your book. What is mind mapping in your, in your opinion? Oh man, mind mapping is so useful and, and, and really underutilized. So all mind mapping is, is just a way of uh, an exercise to create free form thought. Mm -hmm. So you just write down whatever your you know concept is in a middle bubble, whether it's a concept or a character or something like that, that you want to build off of. And then you create branches of ideas. And the really fun thing about this is to not be married to any particular idea and just let your imagination go wild and crazy. And then when you come off with another idea, you do like little sub branches and then you kind of cross out what you don't like and what you like and you circle and then you just kind of follow it around and you, and you create this beautiful myriad tree of ideas and then you're able to come up with, with what you're looking for. And um, it's amazing. And if you do it in a public place, it's really cool because then you start getting influenced by your surroundings. And I actually did it with a uh, with a new writer a little while ago who couldn't come up with a with a killer concept, right? So we sat down and they wrote down their their concept idea and then started doing all these crazy branches. And within 15 minutes, they had everything figured out. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. Are there any tips you have for mind mapping? I'd say mind mapping is just be free with it. Don't don't worry about going crazy. Um, just you know, let it happen. You do it in a public place, um, and and don't be overly judgmental of it. And like I said, if you want to use the environment, and um, you know, you can even do fun things like write down sounds or noises if that even triggers something in your mind, and just kind of let that flow happen. It's kind of like turning on the faucet and just whatever comes out comes out, basically. Yeah, absolutely. You know, your subconscious is always working on this stuff. Like if you're writing a script and say you get stuck at a point, I say go take a little time off and come back, you know, while you're out cooking dinner or running errands, your brain is working on it. And then when you come back and you sit down, you like finish that scene and oh, it's a miracle. Um, well, <laughs> it's the same thing with with developing a concept. So if you can just sit down and then just let all predisposition goes and just sit down and says, okay, I'm just going to create this now. I'm just going to write down whatever happens. Um, then you're going to get some really cool stuff coming out. Now, what is the biggest mistake you see with first time screenwriters? That they think it's easy. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously it's easy. All you need is final yeah. draft and an idea, yeah. right? And you yeah. should just, and you should just get the million dollar check any day now. Oh, no, that's not how it works. That's how it works for you, right? I, I, I've done that four <laughs> times by myself, sir. Just four times. And that was this week. And that was this week. <laughs> <laughs> that was right before lunch. Before uh, lunch. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, they, they, they think it is, that they think it's easy, um, that, that they don't have to do things like format and structure. Or uh, when I meet with new writers, they say, well, do I have to do it this way? And I'm just like, ugh. I mean, yes, you know. And so I have to hit the nail in the wood. To, to build the house. Do yeah, I? Exactly. No, that's perfect. That's an right. exactly, yeah. 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 No, no. Just I want to I want to use duct tape. I think it's prettier and it'll be fine. What could yeah. go wrong? <laughs> yeah. What is it about our industry that in filmmaking and in screenwriting that you, you like anybody feels like they, they can do it? Like oh, you man. don't listen to an, a, a, a symphony and go, oh yeah, I could do that. <laughs> or you, like you know, you, you you don't you don't go like you know what today I'm gonna go build a house. I've never yeah. built a house before. I've seen it on TV. I've seen I've I've watched the HGTV. So I'll, I'll, I'm, sh I'm I'm sure it's not that hard. And I'm also going to mortgage my house. Yeah, I'm gonna mortgage my house. I'm gonna take two hundred thousand dollars out of my house, take a credit line off my house, and I'm gonna build this house that I've never had any experience yeah. doing. What could go I'm wrong? Gonna, I'm, I'm gonna build this house because I saw one on the street. <laughs> so obviously I know how to do it. We're right. the only industry. This the only industry that does that. Like, I yeah. mean, yeah. other than being an entrepreneur, where people are like, "Oh, I can, I can run a business," but it's, it's like even that. It's just That's, like, ugh. well, I, when I teach <laughs> seminars on this stuff, and I sit down, and and I tell people like, screenwriting is the most difficult literary art that exists, is, and I is. just kind of watch everybody's eyes glaze over, like it doesn't land, you know. But like writing a book is is forgiving. Like you can write in whatever voice you want. You can you know you do you do a haiku. You just hit the beats. You know you can write a poem. There's a lot of free form with that. But when you write a stage play or a screen or a screenplay, 
I mean, you've got to write something that some producer is going to consider for, you know, 100000 to a million dollars. Well, now you're going to write something that has to be very specific and deliberate. And it's not open to, um, you know, uh, your, your, your willingness to just kind of do what you want to do. Like you have to do it a very specific way. You can play around, but within the box, there is a box exactly. you've got to fill up. And I can tell you, being an author, I'm sure you as well, writing a book is so much easier than writing a screenplay. Like, infinitely. I sat yeah. down and I wrote a book. I was like, da 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 like, I'm like, oh, I could, just, I could just write. I don't have to worry about beats or I don't have to yeah, worry about yeah. like – structure like basic grammar structure but that's basically what a paragraph in a sentence is and that's basically all i have to worry about oh it's it was so free yeah like i look at screenwriting as the hardest most most difficult soul crushing best wonderful amazing thing you can do Um, Mm -hmm. but writing this book was just like this is fun (laughs) this is fun (laughs) This is yeah. a, a, exactly it is it is something, and I hope everyone. I mean, if, if there's any new film, uh, screenwriters listening to this, it's exactly what we're saying. It is. It is soul crushing. It is brutal, but yet wonderful, lovely, amazing. Uh, but you've got to love it. Uh, yeah, you got to love what you're doing, man. No, there's, is, there's there's a quote that uh, you just reminded me of that I think Jonathan Nolan says, "I hate writing, but I love having written." Oh, it's a great quote. Oh, man, that is an amazing yeah. quote. Um, and then I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's Hemingway who said, writing is easy. All you got to do is sit at the typewriter and bleed. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. <laughs> now, I wanted to talk a little bit about log lines because it's something that we, we hear about and screenwriters like, oh, you have to have a good log line. You have to have a good log line. I have to have a compelling log line. Yeah. First of all, to let everybody listening know what a log line is and <clears throat> any tips on creating a compelling log line. So a log line is just a one to two sentence breakdown of your story, really. Um, it has to be efficient, brutally efficient. It has to be interesting. You have to hook the reader. Um, it can't be boring. It can't be overly wordy. And I have a template in the book on how to efficiently write one and kind of create that hook for it as well. Excellent. Uh, because it's, it's, it's not easy writing a log line. Like if writing a screenplay oh is hard, if writing a screenplay is hard, like boil, yeah, the, yeah. boil down those 90 pages yeah. into a sentence or two. Good luck. Oh God. I, when I had to write ones for like my short films that I did back in the day, I was just like, it, they were power. I'm like, dude, it's a short film. If you can't get this out in a sentence, dude, it's, it's, it's 10 minutes, man. Let's, let's move it along. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And one thing I always, I always want to talk to you about, and, and this is something that writers, and cause I've read a lot of scripts in my day, especially young writers, they, they will bust out the, th- the, th- the thesaurus out in, th- in your script. And you will start getting these 50, 75 cent words oh, out there, man. even some dollar 50 words. Um, oh, man. And it's just like this, this hodgepodge. And I'm reading it. I'm like, dude, if I got to look, I'm like, I, I yeah. feel myself I'm fairly literate. I, you know, <laughs> I, I read, I personally read around two to three books a week. You know, That's I like awesome. I, I I try to my I really try to consume as much information as possible. Man, if I've got to look up the word, it's That's probably it shouldn't be here. It shouldn't be. You know, so yeah. can you can you please just talk about stop trying to show off your English lit degree? <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, yeah, writing a screenplay when you're reading it, it needs to be. Um, it needs to be pleasant to the eye. So you don't want it overly wordy. So you want to be Spartan with your words. You know, when I do like action blocks, it's about four lines. I don't do five. I don't do more than that. I do four lines because it makes my scripts just a breeze for a read. I um, mean, you want to be efficient with, with your description. But if you start pulling out those dollar fifty words, you're not impressing anybody. And if you're frustrating them, um, they're not going to want to keep reading your script. I don't want to be looking up words. You know right. what I mean? You know, there's there's... Uh, you know, instead of saying very tired, you can say exhausted. Sure, that's easy. But if you start getting into something crazy, uh, you're not impressing anybody. You know, the, the, the goal, and I mentioned this, is, is that my job is to glue you to your chair with my words. If you're reading my, my script and you have to go to the bathroom, I want your bladder to be killing you because you can't get up 
and walk away from the script because you need to know what happens. And I'm not going to do that if I'm if I'm getting crazy with uh, with really fancy words. It's not going to happen. Because there is a, a plethora, a cornucopia, if you will, sir, of options. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> by, by, if anyone, please look up cornucopia. Uh, <laughs> if you want, do not use that in a screenplay. It's, no. it's, it's a red flag. Can you imagine? Yeah. It's like the, the uh, he ran, <laughs> ran into the store where there was a cornucopia of, of gun options. Can, could you imagine if you read that line? It's so pretentious. It's like. What? Yeah, it's a lot of. I want to. I want to. I want to buy that script right now. <laughs> exactly. I think that's a dog <laughs> safe script. I think that's a dog saves Christmas movie. I'm not sure, but uh, <laughs> which is obviously pre sold in most multiple, multiple markets around the world right away. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's another thing I wouldn't mind talking about is 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 aiming your script, making your script marketable. Because oh, there's yeah. there's something that's that screenwriters also don't do a lot of is think about uh, specifically about oh is my script even marketable is my script even doable am I presenting this script to the right producer if you if you made a two hundred million if you wrote a two hundred million dollar visual effects extravaganza and you give it to a producer who's used to making one to two million dollars and most of their movies are the Dog Saves Christmas movie that goes straight to Hallmark. Yeah. That and you're, you're like what? nobody understands. Nobody understands me. No, dude, you, you, like you didn't. You didn't do market research. You've got to. You've got to figure. Understand my genius. They don't understand my genius. There's a cornucopia yeah. of scripts out there. No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have a cornucopia of awards. <laughs> exactly. Oh God, that is the word of the day, everyone. Cornucopia. Um, it. But it's so true. So they don't. They don't start. I mean, look, it's an art form. So we we want to write a story that just means something to us. That's great. Mm-hmm. And you should write that. And it's it's fairly cheap to do so. You can write whatever you want. It's the cheapest part of this entire process. Sure. Uh, without question. But if you but what are your end goals when you start writing? And that's I think something that is not talked about a lot is like to actually sit down and go, okay, I'm gonna write this story. What is my goal with this story? Is it for me? Is am I something that I'm gonna try to produce? Is it something I'm gonna make for a few, you know, hundred thousand dollars? Am I gonna try to sell this? What can I do? If I am gonna yeah. try to sell this, what can I do? What can I put in that script that's gonna give me a better chance? How can I load up the script, if you will, with things that are gonna make me more appetizing for purchase or for actually a movie to go into production? What advice do you have? Well, I, and it's funny that you mentioned this because I, I was literally talking about this a couple of nights ago with a young screenwriter, um, and he was frustrated with, um, you know, a lack of direction with his writing. And I, I tell everyone, I have a strategy whenever I plan to do anything with this craft. Um, I strategize. If I want to get an indie horror film made, I look at the market, I look at the demographic I want to work in, I look at the budget I want to work in, and then I hone a screenplay around that and then approach producers who are making those films and then pitch it to them in a way that they want to hear it. And so when they say, wow, this is great, I I think I want to option this, it all makes sense because it's all end up, I've set myself up for success. No one else is going to make you but you, so you can't just you know, write this crazy $300 million feature and then send it out to people wonder why they don't want it. You have to set yourself up for it. Um, so yeah, I mean, strategize and plan, you know, outside of like hiding in some producer's bushes. I'm not saying it wouldn't work, but I'm not saying it's probably not that. the best don't, plan. <laughs> don't do that, dude. Don't do that. Let's, let's just put that out there. there, there don't, yeah, do don't do that. Don't, 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 do that. don't hide in the bushes. Don't stalk. <laughs> Um, generally speaking, don't stalk them. Don't try to, don't run, do not approach them in the bathroom. Yeah, do not, have, think, yeah. that's not it. Like as, as he's, as he's like unzipping, you're like, I can't, do you have a second? <laughs> that's do when you, you have, use your log line. That's what I do. Like, I, I just need two seconds. It's about yeah. a park with dinosaurs. Get out. <laughs> but it's not called Jurassic Park. So, um, <laughs> It's, it's great. called Carna. It's called Carnosaur. Carnosaur. So, it's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, Roger yeah. Corman, baby. You, you're welcome. So, <laughs> um, yeah, just just strategizing, and there's ways. To, there's ways to do it. There's ways to find the connections that you need to get there, and and get your script to where it needs to go, and and always have a plan. And by doing that, you're setting yourself up to succeed. Can you please? Uh, tell me your opinion, and I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I want this information out on this episode. A professional writer 
does not spend five years on a script. A professional no. writer has 20 scripts in their, in their desk or on their laptop, and they're not precious about any of them. They might be more passionate about some of them, but they're not precious. And that's a, a professional writer. Is that yeah. a fair statement to say? Oh, I, I think that's 100% accurate. I mean, I mean, as far as gigs go, I have a nine week turnaround time. I can do it and I've done it in six, but I don't take, I don't take three years to write a script. Um, you but you know, know because, but you know, but you do know those screenwriters who've been on that screenplay for like, and every time you oh, run into man. them, I'm like, how's that script going? Almost there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, oh, so close. I'm almost there. Have you been working on anything else? No, man, just focusing all my energy just on this. Just this one script. Yeah, and in the meantime, I've sold two scripts and I've got one produced, you know, and, and so and like my career is, is going where it needs to go and they're just stuck and then I just want to like shake them. But, you know, that's that's where they're at. Um, so, yeah, the the other thing is is our job is to make a product that the producer, the director really wants um, to see come to fruition, if that means they need their voice in there somehow, or they need things changed in a particular way, um, we're not here to fight and argue and 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 attack. We're here to like, yes, all right, give me whatever notes you have. I love notes. I want this thing to be the best possible it can for you, and and then you make that happen. And so, I mean, that's always been my my attitude and it's it's i mean producers like to work with me so mm -hmm. i'm assuming it's the right attitude <laughs> another mistake that i've seen a lot of is and i did it back in the day because i'm a director for th first and foremost but i would write in my screenplays camera direction dolly oh. dolly in crane up uh, things like that or you start creating the visuals of the film right. so detailed that's also a sign of like Unless you're directing it yourself and you're financing it yourself, it's it's difficult. I mean, maybe if you're a writer director, you might be able to get away yeah. with that. But if you you're not the writer director and it's a it's a work for hire or if it's a product that you're trying to get sold, a director reads it and it's like, oh, I don't I don't need anybody telling me how to shoot this. Exactly. Scene. Yeah. No, I I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we are the screenwriters. Our jobs are to create the story, but we're not the costume designer. You know, we're not we're not the the set designer. We're right. not the we're not the director. We're not the cinematographer. There's there's subtle kind of cool ways that you can make that happen mm -hmm. suggestively, mm -hmm. but you don't have to be married to it. Um, and the other issue with camera directions is one thing I, I hear back is um, I'll hear, well, I really love your voice as a writer. Well, if you're lost in camera directions, the, the reader, the director, producer, they can't hear your voice as a writer because it's hidden behind those camera directions. And that actually cuts into your creativity as well. Now, another big uh, thing I'd love to talk about is the reading script versus the shooting script. And <laughs> oh man, is that a big difference? Can you talk a little bit about the difference between those two? Yeah, well, so the shooting script is what we just talked about. It's it's chock full of camera directions, and it's it's created specifically for production. Um, the reading script is a script that we as a screenwriter writes to make this thing um, be really interesting to to what to create what I call the theater of the mind. So as you're reading, you know, you read a lot. So as you're reading your books or you're reading the script, you start to see the script happen. You start to see it become a movie. You've casted it in your mind and, and, the, and, the, and it happens as a play in your mind. Um, so that can't really happen with camera directions because the camera directions pull you out of the story. If, you're, if you've written a really great script that reads well and is beautiful and isn't overly wordy and you don't have a dollar fifty words in there and it's natural, then that theater of the mind kicks in. Um, and then they're able to become lost in the story and they walk away with a, uh, a positive feeling for it. Yeah, w without question. Now, can we talk a little bit about the difference between sympathetic versus empathetic characters? Yeah. Because that's, again, a another confusion <laughs> that I see a lot of. Yeah, they're two different things. So sympathetic is when... I know you're hurting and I understand that as a fellow human, you're hurting and I, f and I feel bad for you. But empathetic is, um, we'll say, uh, I see you're being abused and I can feel that pain because I've been abused. And so it runs deeper into my core and I have a stronger emotional attachment to you as a person or on film as a character. 
And um, you mentioned The Dark Knight. So a really cool thing about that film is they tried creating empathy for the Joker character by consistently changing his origin story. Yeah. Yeah. He keeps telling the different origin story of how he yeah. got a smile, which is, which is brilliant, which is yeah. brilliant. And, and uh, you know, it, to talk about Dark Knight for just a quick second, I mean, I've never seen such a perfect villain for the hero. Like, yeah, it's great. Like the Joker as a villain works only because of Batman and vice mm-hmm. versa. Like you can't put the Joker in another movie and he's not going to play the same. You can't no. put the Joker in Indiana Jones. Like it's not, you know, you can't put Batman yeah. versus Darth Vader. It, 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 it the, the, to create a, a, a good villain, you need to create basically a polar opposite. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's basically what that is. Do you agree? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's that order versus chaos. I mean, that's why the Joker doesn't work very well in team ups because it, it, it's just too, too random. Um, and, and, you know, things like Luke and Vader, they're polar opposites. Um, and, it, and it really plays thematically and with the character arc as well. If you do the character arc right, you can have that villain character arc will be the polar opposite of the hero arc throughout the story. Now, what is what is what makes a good hero, in your opinion? Yeah, so I think, yeah, a character that has, um, yeah, deep empathy. So some somebody that you can feel for and understand what they're going through and why they're going through it. Um, somebody who's who's written with kind of universal human truths involved in them. So if you kind of infuse uh, a hero character with um, someone suffering with loneliness or they don't feel like they belong or trying to overcome some kind of internal sabotage mechanism that, um, or, you know, the loss of a loved one, things that we've all gone through as the human experience. If you can infuse that in a character and then you put them on a journey through, through this arc of them going through this pain and then learning to overcome it um, makes a great character because when we're watching these films um, and we're watching this character and we, and we, and we really attach to this character. Eventually we're not really rooting for the character anymore. We're actually rooting for ourselves because we want to succeed ourselves. So when we see this character going through this, we envision it as us and not them, which is why you want to have this character have an arc that is satisfying because I want to win as a person. So if I see them, win, I win, and there's this moment of catharsis and release that happens within us, which is why you see like a movie that does really well in an act two and an act three Mm -hmm. or an act one and an act two, but kind of loses it in an act three and people go nuts. Um, It's because they didn't get that. They were hooked to this character. They love this character. And then the ending made them feel wanting. And um, that reflects as, as, uh, as a lashing out at the story. Can you give us an example of some anti character, uh, anti heroes? That are um, like and, like are so. I love antiheroes. Like you also know, like Logan was. Yeah, an anti- you read you, you know, read un, my mind. Unforgiven, <laughs> Unforgiven was an oh, antihero. Um, yeah. You know, Deadpool in ways, but he kind of borders on the parody as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so these guys that are, well, are kind of like. Let's, let's 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 analyze Logan for a second. What makes sure. him like Wolverine as a character is such a he's such a for lack of a, I don't want to bust out Shrek, but he's like an onion. He has multiple <laughs> yeah. layers to yeah. him. He's, he, there's a reason why that character has, is the most popular character in the X-Men universe and has been able to grow. And obviously the casting with Hugh Jackman is yeah, amazing. I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, guy's amazing. I don't even know how they're going to do another one, but oh, I, man. Yeah. We, we but said the same. We said, said that about Batman too. So yeah, you know. it, it's always the same thing, but we haven't seen it yet with the same thing with Iron Man. Eventually they will, there will be another Iron Man one day, yeah. but how is yeah. that going to be? I don't know. But Logan, can we analyze Logan and what makes what 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 are, what are the characters clicking in Logan? Because obviously there's a lot sure. of history oh, that the you. audience l- has has brought to the movie. You know, like yeah. like like Marvel when they start up Avengers Endgame, um there's or even Avengers uh, Infinity War. Like n- there's no conversation about who these people are. There's no conversations about what's going on. They just it's they just assume that you've been on for the ride for the last 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just the yeah, Avengers is all high concept and, and it's just action and let's get to it. They do weave in some subplots and, and some um, some um, theme there going on with, with the Avengers about teamwork and, and, and regret. But the, the interesting thing about 
Logan. And I think what makes him really empathetic is a couple of reasons. One is he's a character that craves to have people in his life, but he pushes them away. And I mean, that's like, we all suffer with that. And another thing is resentment. He has a lot of resentment about the decisions he's made in his life. And I mean, who doesn't regret, you know, something they did in their life. And so by, by putting that in this character and then watching him go through this arc, especially with the little girl, um, where he opens his, you know, her, his heart to her, um, eventually, and then sacrifices himself to see that type of thing. I mean, if, if you're a parent, you're on board with this, you know, right away. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think those are the things that really kind of bring you into this on top of the whole fact that it's actually a Western and people don't realize it, or that, you know, he's the, he's the lone wolf that we've loved and he's, he's coming to the end of his journey on top of all that thing, putting in the, the resentment, the fact that he craves to be loved, but can't let himself love and putting these things in there and then just subtly hitting those beats um, is, and, is what does it. And then he's, and that he's also fighting his younger self in the oh, movie. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I that's mean, just a whole other, yes, the so other layer is. of yeah, stuff to it. I argue, I always tell people, I argue that dark Knight's still probably the best overall superhero film of all time but logan is probably a close second in my opinion my, my, it's solid yeah. it's so it, it should have been oscar nominated in my opinion it was so Absolutely. because you take away the superhero aspect of it it's still just it's it works it's it, a it, western yeah it, it, it works it works without question um now uh what do you have any other tips on um creating great characters in general villains and heroes um yeah, I mean, making them likable, obviously, making them unique and interesting, giving them some internal conflict that actively sabotages their external conflict is really important. Um, so, and we talked about that with Logan, um, putting them on a journey that that doesn't leave any threads undone. So, making sure that they have that that resolution in the end is incredibly important. Um, making sure you have supporting characters that that reflect um, aspects of the hero um, that that allows them to interact and, and show aspects of the hero that you need to sell to the audience in order to really get them behind you. Are they likable? Are they are they frustrated? Are they angry? You know, you know, like like uh, Logan's relationship with uh, with um, Professor X, for instance. Oh. You know. His his relationship there is definitely uh, uh, one of a son who has to k- take care of an elderly father. So there's the regret and the resentment that he has to do that. But then a deep love for him, and then moments of where he's embarrassed by his dad. You know, like at the almost uh, killing uh, almost killing everybody because he has a seizure. Got it? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, there's there's all these these moments and in, in building in that relationship allows us to see different aspects of Logan um, and kind of get into that onion that you're talking about. Now, is uh, what can screenwriters do to get their work read by the right people? I mean, that's a big question, but I was just curious. <laughs> yeah. What you thought? Um, oh no, I, I, you know, I do things uh, like you, you do your research and find who who wants to read it. So, are you talking about getting it produced or getting it or getting it kind of rewritten? Or? No, getting it read by the right, like either getting sold yeah, or sure. getting produced or getting a, a writing assignment from it. Like, wh- yeah. how how wh- any advice on get? Because look. We all know that there's a thousand script. I mean, I literally, I've been in, in in rooms in studios where there's a wall from floor to ceiling just piled up with screenplays. Yeah. That if they've been read once, it's amazing. There's so much competition out there. So, what can you do to set yourself apart? I mean, Bes- I, besides write the greatest screenplay ever written. Yeah, other than writing that killer script that we know you have inside of you. Um, Networking, I think, is huge for this for this industry. Um, film festivals is a great way to network, getting out there, making connections with with that script. And the really cool thing about networking is you just don't know where it's going to go. Uh, I met the very first person I ever networked with. We we are still friends to this day. We um, still uh, have each other's back when things go wrong, or we promote each other when things go great, and we kind of you know help each other out as our careers get better. So like the rising tides lifts all all ships. Um, so I think networking is huge. 
Um, outside of that, if you're looking to like, I want to get it to this guy and I'll never be able to meet him. You just do your research, find out, you know, who's, who's reading for this producer. You can do that on IMDb, IMDb pro, or you can find it on, um, you know, there's books that tell you who to find. And then you send out your query letters outside of that. I mean, uh, getting a manager and isn't, isn't as crazy difficult as everybody thinks it is. It's just about forming that relationship with the manager and making sure that there's someone that can um, get you to where you need to go because managers are like a great key to a door. So because querying can, can, can lead to more querying and you can kind of get addicted to it like a slot machine um, and not get any returns. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but if you foster, you know, a relationship with a manager over time and then they decide to, you know, take you on if they believe in you, um, you know, lots of doors open for you. Can, can you please just tell everybody to, to do some damn research before they query anybody? When I get a link to a screenplay, they're like, Hey, Alex, I need you to read my screenplay so you can get it produced. I'm like, you have not done your research. <laughs> I am not in that position. Nor would I like you get it too, right? So, and it's the shotgun approach. It's just like I'm just gonna I'm gonna spam everybody, and hopefully something will happen. And generally speaking, nothing ever does because you're pissing off. If you're a professional in this business, it pisses you off, and you'll never look at that person again or work with that person. No, it's spam. It's it's spam. Yeah, that's why. Like I said earlier, strategize. Have a strategy. Um, Find who you think this works for, and then send them the query if you have to. And uh, and then go from there. But I think networking is 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 an even better alternative, and 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 building those relationships within the industry. I mean, because nepotism is real. But <laughs> you know, you know, if you're if you're working your way through the industry and you start getting your reputation, like I did, we're like, hey, this guy is he's got something. I mean, I was going to film festivals. I was at a film festival in London, um, and I ended up not going to any of, any of the screenings because I was like, eh. Uh, so I'm sitting in the lobby and a director came up to me and he's like, hey, uh, what are you doing? Oh, I'm a writer. And he had his script with him. And he's like, I have issues. And I'm like, well, I'm bored. So then I look at the script, you know, and I give him notes on it. Well, the next thing you know, I'm holding court at this film festival and I have people literally, Alex, running to me with scripts in hand, handing them to well, what do you think of this? And I spent my time in London doing that, just looking at scripts and and and, and some gigs came out gigs. of that, I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, you know, and then people start liking you and it just builds your reputation. So, I mean, things like that are are priceless. Without without question, man. Um, all right, I'm going to ask you a few questions I ask all of my guests. Sure. What advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Yeah, um, it takes time. It just takes time. You've got to put it in. It's the long you know? game. It's the long game, man. And everybody says it. I say time, talent, and tenacity personally. So how long can you go for? Can you build your skill? And are you are you strong-willed enough or like me, pig-headed enough to really, really stick it out and, and take, take the damage? You know what I mean? Sometimes you get feedback when you're just starting out that is brutally personal. And I remember going to to the grab a drink a few times with a buddy and be like, Oh man, this was rough, you know, but you just kind of get through it. And then you go, do I really want to do this? And if you do, you stick it out and eventually you will get there, but it's not going to be pretty and it's not easy. It could take 10 years. It could take 15 years. But if you think you're going to break out tomorrow, one, I pray that you don't because you're not ready for it. You don't have the tough skin. So if you break out tomorrow, I really worry about you because I don't know how well you're going to handle the system. You know, you kind of have to develop this shell around you, not in a rude way, but in a like, and and not in a, they don't understand my genius way. You need shrapnel. You need some shrapnel. You need some scarring. You need some shrapnel. You need some, some, you need that rhinoceros skin. And and, and, yeah, that's it. that's yeah. I, this is my this is my this is my brand, sir. This is exactly. <laughs> this is like I always tell people. I'm, I'm like I, I'm like I'm like I tell people all the time. Like the reason why there's a grizzled voice on the other end of this podcast <laughs> is because I've I've got shrapnel, yeah. lots of it, uh, in my in my in my body. So uh, and and it's just kind of like that uh, being a kid star. Like that's why so many kid stars don't break out eventually from being kid stars because it's just too much. It's too much, and you can't handle it. And 
it's kind of like I've never swung a bat before, but now you're on the New York Yankees lineup and you're batting, you're batting fourth. Like, but I've never swung a bat, but you're here, you're at the show, but yeah. you, you're just so unready. Like you see baseball on TV. <laughs> It seems easy enough. I mean, and you just swing the bat and the ball goes somewhere. No, yeah, it's, just I, that easy. it's just that easy. But it's a, it, I completely, a hundred percent agree with you. I, I yeah. rather, I rather take some a little bit more time. And I think that's only when you're young, you don't want to go through this. But when you're older, you go, ah, you needed to go through this. You need, you need yeah. it. You need those I mean, obstacles. I had a full head of hair when I started. Man. <laughs> I'm 25, dude. Hey, look at me. Uh, you look good. <laughs> no, I do not, sir. I look horrendous for 25. I look fantastic for 65, but I look horrible for 25. <laughs> oh yeah, we're the. I think we're the same age, and I get 50 a lot, and I'm like, oh, come on, son man. of a bitch. I haven't yeah. gotten that yet. I'm some. No, no, I haven't gotten 50 yet. No one has had the balls to call me out 50 um, yet. But uh, it's uh, it was because I'm vegan. That's why. But uh, oh, I, I clean living, baby. Clean clean living, man. Clean living. <laughs> <laughs> All those Impossible Burgers. Uh, so. Oh God. <laughs> they are tasty. Don't get me started. Um, um, all right. So, what was the book that had the biggest impact on your life or career? Oh. Um, yeah, I gotta go with. I'm gonna. I'm gonna be honest. I'm gonna go with uh, with screenplay. Yeah, that was the yeah. first book so I read yeah. on screenwriting, and that yeah blew my mind. And then from there, that led into you know like story, and then it led into like yeah. the hero with a thousand faces. And then I was well into the rabbit hole, my friend. And I was like, well, I'm not coming out of this for a decade, you know. And then I was just like in it because when I do something, I have to. So I'm weird like this. I can't just learn something. I have to break it down to the genesis of it. Like, where did this start? Where did this come from? Because oh, that's how I have to understand something. It's a lifetime. That's a lifetime. Yeah. So, I mean, so I just spent like a decade really diving into this stuff, going into the monomyth, and then kind of seeing how the different master screenwriters kind of took parts of the monomyth and then kind of called it their own. And then tracking that was actually fun to me because I've been recently, I was called a screenwriting geek, and it's incredibly appropriate. Um, and so, yeah, I'd say that was, that was the entry to my, to my journey on this. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh, um, that I needed to be better that I wasn't, you know, this screenwriting genius. Cause I actually had an early success in screenwriting. Like uh, I, op I optioned my first screenplay. It's easy. All of them should be the, like exactly right. <laughs> that's the worst thing that could happen to you because then it you was awful. because that's because that's the only reference point you have to the business. Like, why is everyone talking about this? It's super easy. You just write yeah. it and it gets. I just it. optioned it. Yeah, it was so in Detroit. We had incentives for a while. They were filming everything here, like you know, like the Dark Knight and all that yeah. stuff. <laughs> and so there was a studio here that uh, that optioned my very first screenplay, and I was like, "Oh, this is great." We did a table read, you know, did the whole show, and oh, okay, great. And then the then we got a new mayor in, and then the incentives disappeared. And I'm not kidding you. A week later, the studio folded. Of course. And then I had like a ten year dry period after that. I was like, "Okay, so this is this is you know, it's, I guess I'm not this genius. <laughs> this isn't how it's supposed to be this easy." And, my first. Uh, my first short film, I'll never forget this, my first short film, which went on to have a lot of success, but my first short film, the first film festival I got into, I won. And I'm like, this oh, is wow. easy. What are you talking about? This is great. Everybody does this. Did not win an award for like 50 other screenings. Like 50 other festivals had to go through before. I mean, it did. It did it was a very successful film eventually, but right. I didn't win another festival of 50, like 50 submissions or some 50 screenings. And you're, that, and you're that guy at the festival, like, oh yeah, it's my first piece. It's my first work and the end I want it. And everybody else is like, yeah, this, this guy, this come on. Son this, of guy, a, right? this, <laughs> this son of a, uh, <laughs> now what did you learn from your biggest failure? Um, so yeah, one of, I, I would say that, um, you can't please everybody, <laughs> you know, that, that a lot of this craft is subjective and not objective. And mm -hmm. so you're going to get work in front of people that, um, people are going to hate. 
Um, I, I did this script that was very much like a Tarantino-esque. It, it was a Rashomon style, three different stories coming yeah. together, interweaving, you know, really difficult, a lot of fun, structure was cool. And I would get like personal attacks from people, you know, <laughs> and I was like, what the hell's going on? I mean, people complaining about my characters, what they do after this story. And I'm like, but the script's over and you're talking about like a month later. I didn't write any of that, you know? And then I, one of my uh, future mentors, he said, well, you know, it's probably pretty good. So yeah. I sent it to him and it was Richard Brandis and he's worked on a lot of great stuff. And then he read it. He's like, oh man, you've got some skill. And so then he, he took me under his wing. Um, and, uh, and the same with like Adele Weston, he took me under his wing as well when, when he, when he read that type of stuff that I did. So, uh, they, then I ended up thinking about like, well, why was it? And it's because my characters were hitting that emotional core with the, with the audience. I was making them feel, and they were getting pissed about it because they didn't like the ending. Um, and so that's what I, I started to take away from that. Yeah. yeah, very cool. Now, what was the biggest fear you had to overcome to write your first screenplay? <laughs> <laughs> there's just for everyone not watching this. There's a smile on his face. <laughs> it's, so, and I actually want to equate this to the book as well, if you don't mind, because sure. it's the audacity to create something to say that you're good enough to do this. And they'd be like, yes. who is this guy? This guy's writing a screenplay. You know, like same thing like the book. Who is this guy's thinking that he's good enough to write a book? You know, it's it's that it's that audacity I had to get over and, and not be like, I'm a screenwriter now. You know, and like just just to just get into the craft and really enjoy it and and leave that ego out of it. Oh, it's it, it, there's a little bit of ego in this business, just a slight bit of ego in this business that we deal with, and let alone our own egos. Uh, oh, yeah. Kind of like when you get your first screenplay options, like instantly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you were. It's not a big deal. I'm sure you were a little difficult to be around during those days. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I just, like you said, I just thought it was like totally normal. Like this, how you write a screenplay and someone wants it. I mean, isn't that how it works? Isn't you know. It? I mean, it was, and then life just beat me down for like years on end. <laughs> and I think life did that on purpose. So like, let's give him a taste. <laughs> so he doesn't have his guard up. And then all of a sudden, we're going to just clock him across the face. Like Mike Tyson says, great quote, everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the face. Oh, and it's yeah. so, so, so true. Um, like how, how bad does this guy want it? You know, I think that was. But, that, but that's, but that's, isn't that a definition of this business? Like, how bad do you want it? Like, because. Oh, absolutely. And every aspect of this business, being a cinematographer, being a director, being a writer, being a producer, whatever aspect you're trying to go after in this business, it's all about how bad do you want it? How much are you willing to put up with? How long are you willing to hustle? Absolutely. How, the tenacity of it. And as, yeah. as, as the famous Rocky Balboa said in Rocky Balboa, how hard can you get hit and keep moving forward? And it's, I mean, it's so yeah. true. It's so true. Um, and that's what this business is all about. And and yeah. I, when I talk to kids, man, when they're coming up and they got the stars left in their eyes, that's why I always, I always anytime I meet someone like that, I beat them down right there. And I do it in a very <laughs> loving, and I do it in a very loving and constructive way because I, and I tell them after I'm done doing it, <laughs> that I'll go, I'd rather you get it from me than yeah. when you're sitting in a room with someone who can actually do something for you. And then you've yeah. ruined that opportunity. I'd rather you hear it from me. I was at a festival the other day. I, got to, I was up on a panel and this filmmaker, I swear to God, he comes up and he's like, and there's like a bunch of power hitters on this panel. Like these guys are all like, they can green, yeah. light, they can green light a movie tomorrow. You know, the nice. 20, 30, $40 million guys, right? Mm -hmm. And this kid's like, he raises up his arm. He's like, so how can I get you guys to watch my short film that's in the festival? And I just, I, I mean, we all, and then you saw Everybody them. kind of sank. They're all awkward. They, like all the guys are awkward because they, they don't want to deal with it. I, you, I'm used to this. I'm used to filmmakers. I know how to deal with it. So, and I said, well, I go, first off, you don't do that. Uh, <laughs> you don't, you don't, you don't just walk up to somebody you've never met before. And it's like, do me a favor. Like you don't do that. You need to provide value to that person before. Yep. And build a relationship with that person. Then later on in the in, in the paddle, he raises his hand up again. And before he, I answer him, I go, 
we're not going to watch your, we're not watching your short. And the whole place, <laughs> the whole place just went down. <laughs> and, and the guys on the panel are like, dude, you're brutal. I'm like, I'd rather them get it from me now when, rather than when they're in the room with you. <laughs> You know, you just said something that is really a great point, though. And and, um, and I talked about this, actually, when I, I did a seminar recently in Vegas, um, providing value. When I network with people, yeah. it's not about read my script. It's about f- providing the value of what they need. How can I help you? So it's not about what I need. It's what I can do for you. And when I network with people, I make sure that um, – they get that vibe from me because I'll listen to them and, you know, everybody wants to talk about themselves. Everybody wants to talk about their project. So mm-hmm. I'll listen, I'll ask some probing questions and eventually I'll learn like, Hey, you know, I heard, you know, I heard about the, your issue with character development and I'm actually pretty good at that. I'd be happy to take a look at your script. And next thing you know, you're working with that person. They're hiring you for a gig, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's, yeah, that's a great point, man. Yeah. Being of value is the first thing I ever tell anybody in this business because it's like, that's, but that's all I was that guy. I was that when I was coming up, when I was younger, I would walk up to somebody of, of any sort of power and you could feel the desperation. You could smell it. Oh, it, was, it just comes it, off. It just of comes you. off oh, of you. The yeah. desperation, the like, yeah. can I get mm-hmm. your card? Can I get, yeah. yeah, the eyes are open. Can I get yeah. your card? I, I, <laughs> I, can you read my script? Can yeah. I mean, I've got, and then you start going into the pitch and you've just met this person. Yeah. You haven't even gotten their name yet. Oh, and now like my radar for that stuff is so like within a second, I'd be like, dude, just stop. Just stop. We've had, uh, we've had very similar journeys. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think it's unique, dude. We all, we all. I think we all start when we're young. Like you know, Tarantino was yeah. like he said at the very beginning, like he couldn't get arrested in this town, and he was literally <laughs> always looking through the window at the party. Like no one would even look. He was desperate to get his stuff seen, but his talent finally rose to the top. And somebody, yeah. I think it was Tony Scott. It was Tony Scott was the first one who bought um, True uh, Romance? Yeah, yeah he brought yeah. True Romance, and then Oliver Stone bought Natural Born Killers. And then that's how it kind of – and then he started doing um, rewrites and script doctoring and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. But uh, but it took – and how long – he was in his mid-30s when he, yeah. when he finally got hit. You know, he was yeah. – it took, it took a minute. It, t- it took yeah. a minute. Yeah, I mean, I'd rather have a late start, honestly, to have the, ma- the maturity behind me and be able to handle it, you know. Without question in this business. Now, I'm going to ask you the last question, the, the hardest question of all, three of your favorite films of all time. Uh, the Fountain. I love the fountain. Oh, it's yeah. so under 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 uh, under um, underappreciated. Oh it's 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 a it's a it's literally a beautiful film. Oh, Darinowski, um, Darinowski is a genius. Uh, you're gonna laugh at this one. Um, no. Return of the Jedi. Over Empire, dude. Oh come it's on! Just, it's the emotional. It's it's the Ewoks. It's the SCF and Ewoks, isn't it? It's, it's the Ewoks. You, it's no, like, I saw it in the theater when I was a kid. I, I and, did too. And there's a whole story behind it, and, and then there was at the theater I was at. There was a Darth Vader walking up and down the aisleway, and I actually crawled over people to get to him, and as he walked by, I touched him, and so that it's just that emotional. So yeah, it has, no, like, so it has less to do with the movie. It has yes. more to do with your personal experience. Got it. Yes. I love Return of the Jedi. I think Return of the Jedi is fun. But when you compare yeah. it to Empire, it's a, you know, but I get it. <laughs> yeah. No, I see. Uh, and what's the, the third fountain? one? Oh, my God. Um, you're going to make me think pretty hard now because I never really consider. I love I love all movies. Um, let's go with. I, I, I'd i say, yeah, nah, it wasn't Empire. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I'd have to just think about it. Any I'd movie, have, just any movie, any, just, you know, any, just name a, just name a movie. movie that you f- it comes to your head right now. It doesn't. It, you're not like we're not going to put it on your gravestone, dude. It's okay. The Matrix. <laughs> but, the Matrix. There, I there like you go. Matrix. There you go. The Matrix. The Matrix is my top five. I is always it? use yeah. Matrix is uh-huh. my top five. I always my top five. Uh, number one is always Shawshank. That's always going to be my number yeah, one. Yeah, that's I, a good one. I, Shawshank, uh, Fight Club, um, Fight Club, the uh, the Matrix. Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction salad. Um, God, what's the? F- I mean, I could, I could, I mean, I can. Then, then now it's a free for all. I get throw. Empire yeah, I mean, because now know, it's a free for all. So many films, you know. But Fight Club, Fight Club, uh, Fight Club specifically, I just freaking love. I mean, I love Seven too. I think Seven is amazing. I mean, I mean, I like The Sixth Sense. You know, that was a huge one for me back Sixth in the day because I was like, oh my god, you but know, my, mine was blown, of course. Yeah. Spo- spoiler alert, he sees dead people. But uh <laughs> He's actually dead the whole He's time. The whole 
all time. Don't tell anybody. That's, and if, if I get any angry emails, it's over like almost 30 years old at this point. Isn't it? Like, so it's, it's, but I was going to watch it next week. <laughs> exactly. I've never seen this movie. Um, now, where can people find you and your book and, and uh, all the wares that you have, sir? Yeah, so the guide for every screenwriter is uh, is on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. Um, there's the guide for every screenwriter dot com. You can find me at uh, wefixyourscript dot com because that's that's the brand that that I run. Um, right. And I also uh, run the Script Summit Screenplay Contest as well, which is uh, top twenty biggest screenplay contest by the Script Lab. Mm-hmm. Awesome, dude. Well, man, listen, yeah. it's been a pleasure. I'm sure we could talk for at least another two, three hours, uh, yeah. which is always a sign of a good guest uh, when we we could just keep chatting and chatting. So, uh, thanks, Alex. That's yeah, I, I appreciate it, man. So thanks again for dropping the, those knowledge bombs on uh, on the tribe today. And hopefully we've done some good here today. Maybe we've saved some egos. Maybe we've helped somebody along their path a little bit. And things that you and I take for granted, they might have just gone, huh, so so don't, don't yell out, read my script, huh? That's not a... <laughs> Don't do that, yeah, huh? Yeah, don't run after them. <laughs> and, and don't approach them in the restroom. Yeah. <laughs> if we could take – if there's a – because there's a cornucopia of things we learned in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> man, it was a pleasure having you on the show, brother. Yeah, I really appreciate it, man. Nice to meet you. As I promised, Jeffrey Calhoun brought the pain and brought the knowledge bombs on the tribe today. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for all your amazing knowledge. And if you want links to anything I talked about in this episode, including all of his amazing services that he offers screenwriters, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS056. And I also have links for those in the screenwriting resources page on Indie Film Hustle. Now, guys, I'm also working on a you know a little project just for the screenwriting tribe, just for the Bulletproof Screenwriting Tribe. I am going to be coming out with some big stuff, hopefully in the next two to three months, uh, for you guys specifically. I think it's due, it's time, and I'm going to be bringing just an insane amount of value to you guys coming up. So please keep an eye out for that. If I were you, I would be very excited. (laughs) Thank you guys for listening so much. I really do appreciate it. You guys have made this show one of the top screenwriting podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and all other major podcasts podcasting platforms. And I am humbled and thank you so much for all the reviews. If you haven't reviewed this show yet and have not subscribed yet, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com, subscribe and leave an honest review for the show. It really, really helps us out on the rankings. I truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you again so much. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at BulletproofScreenwriting.tv. Texting enrolls you into reoccurring automated text messages. Message and data rates may apply. Come on, one more rep. You got this. Uh, Ten. There it is. Nice work, man. You're a beast. (sighs) Thanks, man. I feel better than I have in years. And I got to tell you, taking Nugenics makes a huge difference for me. Nugenics? That's the uh, testosterone booster with TV ads with Frank Thomas. The big hurt, right? Oh, yeah. This is a legit product. The key ingredient is Testofen, which helps boost free testosterone levels and increase lean muscle mass. Well, it's clearly working for you. Hey, are they still giving out complimentary bodies? for people to try for themselves? Yeah, Nugenics is a great way to increase lean muscle and feel stronger with more energy and endurance. Man, I need to get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics. No problem. You just got to send them a text. Text BODY to 42424 right now for your complimentary bottle of Nugenics, the number one selling free testosterone booster at GNC. Nugenics samples are not available in stores, so text BODY to 42424 right now. Text B-O-D-Y to 42424. That's BODY to 42424. Is your cell phone bill out of control? Then this is your wake-up call. The new track phone wireless gives you unlimited talk and text starting at $20 a month, no contract, plus unlimited carryover data with active service. Yep, the new track phone wireless. Now you're in control. See terms and conditions at trackphone.com.